Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to this Society of Illustrators event tonight. I am R. Sikoriak. I am your host. And this is Making Graphic Adaptations from Text to Comics. And I um, have a great lineup of guests tonight. And I really appreciate you uh, watching us. Um, I, first of all, I want to thank the Society of Illustrators for having us back. We did a panel last year on Zoom, which went great. And um, also a shout out to Karen Green, who was a good consultant when I was first putting this panel together. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we're going to talk to uh, these four artists about their books individually, talk about how they approached uh, adapting literary classics, and then, um, and then we'll open it up for uh, discussion amongst the five of us and then we will also take questions at the end so uh you'll get the you'll get the sense of the of the uh of the format as we go so um uh to start with i'm going to do a little intro uh and i i want to say that we're doing this on will eisner week uh which happens every march and um this seemed like an appropriate topic for will eisner who made many graphic novels in the course of his 87 year life um, he started making comic books like The Spirit. He moved on to make uh, graphic novels like Contract with God. He made educational comics. He made uh, adaptations. Um, I just want to show you a few of his, his pieces here that seemed relevant to our conversation. Um, he uh, once did a, a, an adaptation of Hamlet's soliloquy on a rooftop. And if you know Eisner's work, you can see how this plays into a lot of his strengths. Uh, you get the sense of place, you get the, the sort of theatrical acting of his characters, and he's really spread out the narrative over the course of 10 pages. Um, and it's a nice experiment in what you can do when you work with a literary text. Um, Eisner also did slightly longer, but still somewhat compressed, uh, adaptations of Don Quixote and Moby Dick and others, and these really showed off his his sense of character, his sense of atmosphere, his sense of place. Um, and um, this was an ongoing concern with him. His, one of his last books was called Fagin the Jew. And this is a kind of a retelling, a reimagining of a character from Dickens, sort of going to his backstory and sort of, it's kind of a rehabilitation of a character who uh, is very stereotyped in the novel. So through his life, uh, Eisner was kind of competing with literary classics, trying to make his own, you know, uh, adapting them and also kind of conversing with them. And I think all of our guests do that as well. Um, I'm going to back up a little bit first before we introduce them. They're coming soon. Oh, I should at least say who they are. We have Bree Indigo, John Jennings, Hope Larson, and Ryan North. I'm sorry I didn't announce you at the beginning. <laughs> So hi, everybody. Okay. I'll get to you in a minute. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to give a little bit more background. Um, I just wanted to mention, if you grew up in the United States like I did, your main uh, uh, knowledge of classics in comics might be Classics Illustrated. This was a series that ran from the 1940s to the 1960s. I grew up in the 70s and saw back issues of these. These were monthly comics that adapted a literary classic every month in a regular comic book traditional pamphlet format. So to get Shakespeare into under 60 pages, you had to do things like this. This is a page. Uh, this is Hamlet's soliloquy again, all compressed into one page. Uh, so I find this sort of charming, sort of hilarious. I appreciate the effort. Um, but it's only more recently where artists have been able to spread out and do works that can grapple with the text in a more, you know, a more uh, open, open hearted way, I guess. Um, so there's been such an explosion in graphic novels and in graphic adaptations over the last 20 years. Um, I've just put up a few here. These are different YA adaptations that are out. There are series like the Babysitter's Club. There's um, anthologies like the graphic canon, and then there's like single book adaptations of, of uh, different authors. And there's such a explosion of uh, these kinds of adaptations for adults and for kids 
in the last 20 years that it's hard to choose. I threw up six, excuse me, I put up six panels here just to show you sort of the breadth of what's available. You've got Shakespeare, Flaubert, Kafka, Dante, Paul Auster, all of these artists approach the work very differently. It's much longer in most cases. Sometimes the page size is actually much bigger than your traditional comic book. So there's lots of ways of like looking at these classic texts that people are familiar with and kind of reinterpreting interpreting them and really kind of letting the artistic uh, vision of the artist show through as well as the original text. Um, and one more bit of background before I start into our, with our guests. Um, I have been doing adaptations myself for over 30 years. My first book collected different adaptations into very, very short versions. So this has this book, Masterpiece Comics, has 12 uh, adaptations in one 64-page book. More recently, I've been sort of trying to follow the times and been expanding uh, into longer form texts. Here I've done the iTunes Terms and Conditions as a graphic novel and uh, the US Constitution as a graphic novel. These are full lengths focusing on one text. I use the word graphic no novel loosely. Um, in any case, um, just to give you some background, this is a huge topic. I wanted to orient you a little bit. I've already thrown a lot of information at you, but for now we're gonna slow down and we'll speak to each artist individually. And we're gonna start with Brie. Brie Hello. Indigo. Hi, Brie. Should I, I'm going to read your bio quickly just okay. to give people a little background, uh, but great to see you. Thanks for doing this. Uh, Brie is an illustrator based in Southern California who tells stories of his tough girls and those outside the gender binary. Their projects include Jamie, an LGBTQ coming of age webcomic on the Tapas and Webtoons app, and Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy, which was her their debut graphic novel. So hi, Brie, thank you for joining us. My pleasure, thanks for having me. Sure. So I've asked each of the artists to send me some samples of their work and, uh, and Brie sent me some pages from her version of Little Woman, which I should say is, um, was written by Ray Terciero, is that right? Mm -hmm. and, you, okay. and you drew it. So I was curious about your process here. Um, this is a little different, it's a, it's a modern retelling. Yes. Um, so I was not involved in the writing process. I was um, hired um, way after it was even done. Um, so really all that Ray did was deliver the script. We went back and forth on ideas. Um, and then I delivered, you know, character designs. And then we went like we did all the thumbs, all the pencils, all the inks. We just kind of went really streamlined with it. So that was like the most literal form of a of a how we tackled it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, yeah. obvi obviously these pages don't have um, word balloons, but you really can see who the characters are. I'm assuming this really plays into the kind of work that you do generally. Your work is very much about these kinds of characters. Yeah, like I mean, at first I was like, oh wow, I'm so like this is such a random opportunity but I was just like oh wait no like this is pretty much what I'm already like doing with the stories that I like to tell uh just stories that touch on like family found family like uh coming of age and whatever that means for an individual um I I never thought I would fall into these genres but I think that it's also just been like a form of self-soothing as well like I really enjoy seeing people uh, triumph over challenges and stuff like that, but like not massive ones that a lot of people can't relate to. Like everyone loves a superhero story, but like I really love seeing just like everyday people get over like the the small things that feel so big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you really get a sense from that here, even without the words. I've put in some pages with text later on just to give you some the full picture, but I really this gives us an opportunity to really like look at the characters you've created. I was curious if you if you looked at other versions of the story, was that relevant to what you were doing? Um, it, like, I mean, we're all like, well, not we're all, but like, I was familiar with uh, Little Women, like the novel before and the movie. Um, and I think the more I dealt, dove into like creating this myself, the more I saw it everywhere. And especially since we were creating this during the like an anniversary year. So um, 
I kind of like had no choice, like not that that's a problem, but I just saw it everywhere. <laughs> um, but I think my idea of it was pretty like basic. Like I, I didn't grow up on it. Um, so I just kind of had the idea of like, oh, it's about four girls who are growing up. And, you know, I got to appreciate a lot more as I was, you know, trying to respect the source so that like, you know, like the veteran, like fans and the people who grew up on it, like would see that, like I came at it with respect. Um, but I didn't want to have too much to where, like, I felt like restricted for my decision. Mm -hmm. And I guess race set the template, right? So you were able to maybe go a little farther with the drawings because, because Ray had kind of laid it all out in, in terms of the text. Yeah. When it came to like the personalities of the characters that he, uh, developed, uh, it was pretty much already there. I just kind of had like my my job was to like and you know the job of the illustrator can be just to draw it or it can be like to like con connect with it and and respect and understand where the writer is coming from and you should go about it that way. Like in a way, I I wanted this to be something that I was proud of and that became a part of me. So I you know I dove in trying to respect the readers, respecting the source. Uh, respecting Ray, um, but at the same time, like thinking, what can I bring to this that 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 adds to the project as opposed to just uh, doing what's right in front of me and just getting the paycheck. Um, so, if I remember correctly, all that really was in the um, the character descriptions was just like it's a blended family, um, but there are really no restrictions as to what that looked like. Um, so, I mean, since I come from one, uh, not only blended but mixed. Um, it was just pretty easy for me to just be like, well, you know, I'm not going to overthink it. I'm just going to pour myself into it so that I can relate to it. And then so people like me can relate to it. Um, so like there was, um, I think I'm getting off track, but no, no, not at all. This is great. <laughs> okay. So like, uh, I wanted to make sure like each of the girls, let me formulate myself, right. So like the one thing that like people in the fandom really, really love is just how individual each of the girls are, which is obvious we're all individuals, but they go about their issues in different ways based on how, obviously, based on who they are. But I think that's what makes people interested in them. So I wanted to add another layer of that. Like, I, I don't want it to just be like, oh, so let's just randomly assign race and height and body size to these characters just to make them diverse. I really put thought into like, into like what role what the role should look like for each character just two examples is meg and amy like amy deals with uh like racism at school but not in a way where it's like heavy heavy stuff if it's middle school but that stuff still really bites and hurts um and i thought that it would make sense that like amy is not a white passing mixed child um and i could relate to that because growing up like i had like microaggressions thrown my way. Uh, and I'm like, I'm pretty fair skinned and I dealt with that. Um, so I was just like, I wanna make sure that like, it makes sense for this person to have this experience in our current like age. And then with Meg, her role is like second mother almost. And, uh, and that's just a lot for a kid, even if she's the eldest. And uh, when I was reading her character, her dialogue and, and thinking about like how I would further develop her, I saw a lot of like my aunts and my grandmother in her. Um, and so I just thought that like, that she should look like them because like, it's not uncommon to see young black women having to take roles of like a mature role in the family to help out nowadays. And um, I also, I still wanted to, put that in a positive light, like to say, like, you know, anyone who finds themselves in a situation like Meg, like, you know, you can still be yourself, find yourself and, and put yourself first. It doesn't always have to be everyone else. Um, but I put a lot of thought into the characters uh, that even subconsciously at the time, I didn't really even know. And like, just me sitting back and like thinking about the process again, especially thinking about my answers for this panel like it just really like started to hit me just how much like these girls have helped me grow even at 26 when I was doing it uh like it really helped me look in on my younger self and see how like 
stories like this could have helped me heal maybe a little easier if I had them growing up. And so I'm just, I'm happy that it's out there now for people who, who might need it. <laughs> Took well, a million routes to get here. <laughs> No, that's great. That's great. Uh, so the, actually, the spread we have up here actually shows each of the each of the four sisters on the left hand page and on the right hand page. So you can sort of see the dynamics, their dynamics in the world and and their own personalities really coming through. Yeah. So that that was a very good description of that. Thank um, you. I love all these girls so much. Like they <laughs> like have completely like taken my heart, and uh, I just love them. They're so sweet. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, thanks. I um, we're gonna move ahead, but we'll come back to you unless there's anything else you want to say before we jump jump. No, I think I've said a, I think I've said a lot. I want to see what everyone else has to say. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks so much, Bree. We'll Thank we'll uh, we'll get back to you in a minute. Oops. No. Our our next uh, our next guest is John Jennings. He is a professor of media and cultural studies at the University of California at Riverside. He is an award-winning New York Times bestselling author, illustrator, and scholar who studies graphic novels, black speculative fiction, and race, and does a lot more. <laughs> Hi, John. How are you? Sorry. How are you doing? <laughs> good. That was good. Amazing, so. no, that's fine. That's good. That's fine. So, so I uh, I put some examples up of your three most recent uh, adaptations, um, and I, I just figured we'd go through them. Uh, okay. So. Um, I think I think maybe Kindred is the first one that really um, brought you to a different audience. I mean, you've certainly been doing a lot of different work over the years with black comics and so forth. Um, mm. But um, can you tell us about this? I know you had been working on this for many years before you even got the job. Well, um, first of all, well, thanks for having me, by the way. First of all, um, you know, I've been working, this is co-adapted. I mean, I, I, I'm an illustrator. And on this particular, on these particular projects, uh, Damian Duffy is my has been my longtime collaborator for about oh, 17 years now. I think we started off we started off doing curate curatorial work and then kind of segued into making comics, you know. And um, yeah, and so basically, this is weird how how this came to us. We when I was still at the University, at the University of Illinois, um, I want to say Beacon Press did a call for, for submissions for. Uh, an adaptation of Kindred. Uh, it's gonna be a black and white book, probably 150 pages, which I don't even know how that was gonna happen. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, and, and we tried to get it then. And we put together like this, you know, we just spliced together a, a pitch over a week or so and got it in right under the wire and uh, totally, totally didn't get it. And this is like 2009 <laughs> or so. And then what happened was, um, you know, I was actually, we were working on something else. We were going to, to Comic-Con for a totally different reason. And, you know, we're trying to get things picked up by publishers. And um, it turns out that at the time, Sheila Keenan was still at Abrams Comic Arts. And, um, you know, I showed her some of the work I was doing. And then she was like, I think you'd be perfect for this adaptation I'm trying to do. And, and have you ever heard of Octavia Butler? And I'm like, well, well yes, I have actually. And I love her work. And I was like, what book are you trying to do? And she said, Kindred. And then I realized that the, the Beacon Press book never happened. It never came out. And this is like 2012, so I'm like three, three years so. And uh, yeah, and that's how we ended up um, working on the project. And there's some other rigmarole and, and, and wildness with like editorial and all kinds of stuff. But eventually we did uh, get it done. But yes, this is our first like really large graphic novel for like a mainstream publisher but we've been working on independent comics for a, a long time before that and doing like you know scholarship curate curatorial work that kind of thing right um i i uh yeah the, i mean <laughs> just for now we'll focus on this but i i did i i in 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 doing some more research on you i realized how many different projects you have going it's pretty amazing um what what is really striking to me about this book is that you have to kind of juggle these two these two worlds it, the book takes place in the 70s but the characters travel back in time and you have to sort of show these different worlds and and there's a lot of really interesting storytelling devices and also just the idea of cutting the text down this book is over 200 pages that's probably still potentially short <laughs> yeah it's, it's actually still shorter than the original and yeah it's um 
Uh, one, one of the most more difficult things about it, for instance, you're, it's a time travel novel, but it's it, it, it it's more like existential time travel. It's not like a TARDIS or like a DeLorean or anything. It's just transporting Dana back through time. There's some type of other type of uh, some kind of connection to the past that is uh, both physical and spiritual, or some or, or we don't know. And so it kind of like it almost becomes like, uh, well, I mean, it, it's, it's a horror story too, because it's about slavery. It's about like, you know, the, um, the, the dealing with, with, with the past uh, that still haunts us to this day, that kind of thing. And um, one of the things that we, uh, one of the things that we kind of lamented was the fact that in the book, the original text, you're reading through it, you don't realize that Dana's black until the second chapter, mm. because it's not, it's not really, something she's not described as being a black woman right and so you know of course in a, this particular uh, uh medium you know I, I, obviously she's a black woman <laughs> so so that was one thing it, it was just it was just an amazing piece like if you're reading through it and you go to like the second chapter rufus uses uh, the little boy here who she's saving constantly uh uses the n-word and then she realizes oh my goodness <laughs> you're in the we all really, oh my god she's in she's in the middle of a of a slave plantation then it becomes a horror story immediately and, and you're like oh my god get out of there right now right and so so i just haven't seen anything like that before so as far as like different uh um techniques and stuff you know usually uh, when you're doing time travel things um a lot of times you do like the uh they kind of try to true uh, a trick of say like using a monochromatic piece of black and white to kind of show the past, you know. Uh, but in the uh, in this particular case, what we did is, you know, Butler was describing the fact that what you know, and this is actually one of the horrible things about it, is that the more Dana traveled back to the slave plantation, the more comfortable she felt, and she slipped into being a slave like really, or the idea of being a slave like really easily, and. Um, so it is, we flipped it because again, like it's 1979. So it's still the past for us. So we actually use this kind of like maroon kind of sepia tone. Actually, and, and this particular tone is actually based off of like scarring because everything about blood connection. So I actually sampled uh, the actual color from like scabbed over wounds as, as kind of like the color tone, you know? And um, yeah, so when she, when she traveled back through time, you know, everything was lush and green and, you know, uh, comforting, that kind of thing. Because at the beginning of it, she's moving to a home with her husband, Kevin, and she's in an interracial relationship, you know, in this, in 1979, but they haven't made it into a home yet. It's a house, you know, it's still like, it's not, it's, they're, they're, it's not unpacked yet, you know, um, there's meat that's still in the, you know, in, in the sink that's still chill, that kind of stuff. It's not even like, they haven't made any memories there. And so the more that they could travel back through time, um, the more uh, comfortable it feels. And that's, that's something that was really, Kind of terrifying. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's why I like to do storytelling tricks and stuff. Damien, who's also the letterer, um, whenever there was a time shift, of course you'd you'd shift from like, you know, monochromatic, you know, this monochromatic red to these different color schemes. But you also would see like the panel border break, you know, because essentially when you're doing a comic, I mean, each one of these each one of these panels is a is a slice of time, right? So so you so you can actually literally time travel from one piece to the other by just juxtaposition or like breaking down the borders. But essentially that's what panels are, right? They're, they're indexes for time, right? So, and so those are some of the things we're kind of playing around with, with the storytelling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I mean, the, the, it's interesting you bring up the, the fact that um, her race is undefined in the book and that so much is very explicit in the comic, um, but it also, as you say, it sort of goes back to um, reminds me of like you mentioned horror comics. So I think about like EC comics and like yes. you know kind of these. It's not it's not the subject matter that they could possibly approach, but there's things about it that there are echoes in the way that comics work that that you bring back into this. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, if you look at the the underlying structure of it, it feels more like a goth like a gothic story. You know, you have like tropes from the gothic. There's a doppelganger, like her 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 ancestor Alice is her doppelganger and, and then there's body horror like as soon it starts out with her losing a, a limb that's fused into a wall right um, there's this weird like romance that's going on between her her great 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 grandfather and her husband you know it's and, and you know Alice too I guess and also um, you know gothic texts deal with like you know found artifacts or strange artifacts and so there's this family bible that actually is a key 
um, you know, a key element to her understanding why or what her mission might be, you know. This is very disturbing because essentially, you know, she has to not only survive, but she has to, she has to save this, you know, this ancestor of hers, Rufus, that actually ends up being a, a terrible uh, product of his environment. He's a horrible person, actually. <laughs> and you, the audience wants to kill him. Like one of my friends said that when she was reading, reading the book, she just literally like tossed it across, the, <laughs> she like <laughs> flung it across the room. <laughs> Of course, she went and picked it up and finished it, but it was like, you know, it's just, he's, he's very, he's a very terrible uh, character that he, and he has to survive in order for Dana to survive. But the other thing is she has to facilitate the assault, the sexual assault of her own, you know, flesh and blood in order for her and her uh, cohort of people, you know, her family to survive. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's not right. And you're right, it's more horrific. I mean, we won a Bram Stoker award for it, right? So <laughs> it's seriously, so it was like, <laughs> it's a horror story. Yeah. Yeah. It's not escapist, you know. No, no, not at all. Um, I, I just wanted to throw in some pages with this really lovely artwork on them. I, yeah. the, we could talk about this all, all night, but I did actually just want to mention your other books. And also, well, this is a little bit of the process which you talked about too. Um, uh, well, you mentioned earlier how you'd been thinking about this a long time. So I guess the collaboration with, um, with Damien Duffy was, Kind of natural for you yeah 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 it definitely was um damien you know like i said he had the chore of uh and i want to say he maybe read this i think he read kindred like probably around 18 times or so you know i read about half of that but i would actually like listen to an audiobook as i was drawing you know we want to kind of imbibe or embody the story you know uh, unfortunately you know um we lost Octavia Butler in the early 2000s, I want to say 2007 or so. So we did not have the benefit of her guidance on anything like this, right? Just her estate and uh, agent and such. So we were trying to be very respectful, uh, as Bree said, of the text, but also we wanted to really, really dial into the things that comics did better. Uh, than, you know, the thing to remember about adaptations is that, you know, as soon as you shift it to a, a different medium you're changing the story because each medium has its own set of affordances so that's that's something to always remember about him right um oh this i just wanted to mention your other two recent books <laughs> um just very briefly just to sort of say you know you've also done you're doing a series of butler adaptations yes yeah we're working on parable of talents next actually mm -hmm. yep. and this is a this is a dystopian future present i suppose i mean For her, it was, theory, i don't even yeah know. <laughs> hard, to say. hard to say but um was it was it was it easy quote unquote easier to go back to working with her the second time i mean working with her text? it's never easy to work with octavia butler's work i mean she doesn't write easy anything right you know? i mean honestly if you read her, her her easiest book is a draw and that's like wow see it's like it's a draw <laughs> so, <laughs> other, than, other than that though no she writes she writes very very hard you know stories and she because she's dealing with these big problems you know yeah um one of the things that's easy is that you know the first book is done you know by hand it's more, more traditional and so I would, I, it's actually drawn with like sharpies because i want mm. to use like a um an unwieldy uh something that was difficult to work with, you know, because it's a difficult subject matter. I was trying to channel, you know, uh, people like Kathy Kowitz and, you know, Lynn Ward, people like that who are, you know, doing things that were hard to deal with. This is totally digital. This is totally done. This is done like on, you know, iPads. So, and uh, Damien, you know, had a lot more confidence in this particular um, adaptation too. So um, the first, the first draft of his script, it was like, oh my God, I just read Parable of the Soul, but as a comic, <laughs> you know? So yeah, it was just, it was almost like perfect. You know? um, the other thing is that we actually had like a sensitivity editor. Uh, our friend, uh, Tanana Redu, who teaches this book like every year at UCLA, you know, we wanted to make sure that we had um, a black woman's voice front and center, uh, who, who someone who understood the text, you know? Uh, so yeah, anyway, so those are some of the things that were, different I think about this particular piece um one of the most uh apparent things of course is like Par a parable of sore is uh, an epistolary you know it's, it's, it's put together um you know novel it's 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 parts of like you know Olamina's journal but it's also you know pieces from other texts and things like that and even and that even changes a lot more in parable of talent so it's pieced together from all these different pieces of ephemera you know which I really dig personally so. 
and also is kind of like the collage of comics, I guess, right? You've got right. these different images butting up against each other. Um, I also, of course, just wanted to mention your most recent book, which you've written rather than drawn, yes. but another adaptation, uh, mm -hmm. After the Rain. And um, this is a shorter story, so probably had a little bit, had a more room to spread out a bit. Yeah, and that's one of the main things is a lot of different different things. Like, so I actually also did the colors on this too. Um, and then, um, and this is a project that I wanted to work on with my friend Nadia Cora for for a long time. I really, it's one of her. I'm a big horror fan. It's one of her only horror stories, if not her only horror story. It's a short story, you know. So it gave us a little bit more elbow room to kind of play with graphically and kind of play with like other elements, like you know, using the gutter for like storytelling things of that nature. And we actually did change things a lot to fit the, the narrative to it. But what was different, of course, is that we actually could ask the author, <laughs> say, hey, what do mm -hmm. you think of this idea? And she had a lot of input on even things like cover design and stuff like that, you know? Um, and she was very gracious to let us use. But it's something I wanted to do for a long time. And I actually had started it in different versions, but, you know, as I got uh, busier, uh, and this is the first book for my Megascope in print too, so with, 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 um, with Abram. So, but yeah, it is a very different uh, experience and we could talk more about it later if you want. <laughs> but That's great. All this time. Sorry. Sure. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Thank you, John. Well, yeah, we yes, will yes. get back to you. <laughs> so next we have Hope. Thank you for being patient, Hope. <laughs> uh, Hope is the Hi. New York. Hi. <laughs> Hope is the New York Times best-selling and Eisner Award-winning author of multiple books for young readers, uh, including All Summer Long, Salt Magic, and A Wrinkle in Time, the graphic novel. And here we are. Uh, so, um, so yes, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Kosh. I've, I've been loving listening to everybody else. It's kind of, I'm kind of like reluctant to come out of the audience and talk, but <laughs> it's, well, you know, I'm, I'm excited. It's been, um, this book is is a decade old, so it's fun to to go back to Wrinkle in Time. Great. Well, and I know you, as you mentioned in your bio, but you have more books than that. You you have you're very prolific. Often you collaborate with with artists, but in this case, this is entirely your own. Uh, just me uh, and Madeline Lingle. Yeah, yes. yes, you're wrong. I, I, as soon as I said it. <laughs> yeah, so. uh, it was my, I want to say like maybe my fifth graphic novel, something like that. And um, I get asked a lot how this, how I, I got the rights to do this. And mm -hmm. I was pretty much cold called by an editor, Margaret Ferguson at Farrar, Strauss and Drew. She emailed me and said, hey, would you be interested in adapting A Wrinkle of Time? And it was one of the only times in my career that I've gotten uh, a message like that and had to be like, there's no way I'm reading that right. That can't <laughs> be real because this is a book that I've loved so much since my childhood. And um, it's it's a classic. It's beloved by so many people. And um, I was so flattered and so scared that I actually ended up turning the project down after thinking about it because I was too afraid that I was going to mess it up. And fortunately they came back and asked me a second time and, and I, I went for it. It's great they wanted you as much as, uh, <laughs> as, much as you wanted to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Now this is one of the things that, you, you've sent me some pages, so if there's specific things you wanted to talk about in these pages, let me know. But I was also curious, I read that you really tried to keep as much of the dialogue as possible. It's a fairly long graphic novel, but you did try to keep in as many scenes and, 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 and again, like dialogue as you could. Is that right? Yeah, it, the, the, so the book is 400 pages long, a little bit, actually, yeah, 400. And um, I wanted to be as faithful as I possibly could with the book because the, the thing about A Wrinkle in Time is that it doesn't really lend itself to being cut. Um, it, it sort of meanders around and if you start, it's like this house of cards and if you start taking stuff <laughs> out, it just collapses. And so I pretty much just wanted to include as, as much of the book as I could. And actually when I talked to my editor about this later, she was like, yeah, I felt the same way. I didn't really know how we could cut it down. 
Um, so what I did was I got a cheap paperback copy of the book and I just went through with a marker and it was like, okay, this feels like a page. This feels like a page and just drew lines through the book. And then I wrote the script from that. Um, and I, I really did want to keep most of the dialogue in because most of the book is dialogue. Um, the thing that is so interesting about Madeline Lingle that I didn't know until, I didn't find this out until after I finished the book or was in the middle of, of drawing it, um, but she was an actress and um, like a, a stage actress. And I think maybe she did some playwriting as well. And the knowing that when you go back and look at the novel, it really feels um, a bit like a play because there's not a lot of description. There's not really a ton of action. It's mostly just the characters talking to each other and having these heady conversations. Um, and that was awesome for me because I generally try not to put a ton of caption boxes in or it, at that point, that was certainly how I felt about caption boxes. Now I'm like, why not use every tool at, at your disposal as a cartoonist? But at the time, I really wanted it to, to feel, cinematic isn't really quite the right word, but um, I just felt like captions took you out of it a little bit. Oh, this yeah. is, <laughs> this was one of my favorite sections of the book. This is actually like a fairly lengthy section that is, um, while Meg is, is paralyzed. And I just love an all black comics section with just the, the speed, the balloons and, and stuff. And, um, I feel like it, it really feels the way that section of the, of the novel does. It's dark and, and claustrophobic. And it was fun to be able to do that. Um, I don't usually feel like I have the luxury to try something as formalist as this in a graphic novel because there are never as many pages as you want. So I'm always like trying to pick my battles and really only in a 400 page book would I let myself do like an eight page section that's just <laughs> black. <laughs> well, it's such a dramatic part of the novel. I mean, you really, it really pays off to have that in there. Yeah. Um, I know a couple of other people, everybody else really has talked about this um, pressure, I guess, to be faithful to the book and to respect the text. And I think the only thing that I consciously sort of took out was a little bit of the religious elements of the novel, just because I'm not a religious person and I just really struggled with those parts of the book and with relating to them. So I don't think we, I don't think I took it out like completely, but I definitely uh, submerged it a little bit more. There's, there's the brain it, that was a part that I kind of struggled with because I was like, I feel like this works in the novel, but it's such a weird thing to put into a comic for kids. Um, like, is a brain scary? Like, how do I make the brain seem seem frightening and seem gross? So I did a bunch of sound effects. Mm -hmm. So, so when you're visualizing something like this, or or working with the editing, like you were saying before, what was the estate involved? How did was your were editor very hands on? Did they kind of let you go? Uh, the estate was involved. Uh, Madeline Lengel's estate is awesome. It's her family. They were so um, just down to let me you know, follow my my own voice to to make it my own in a in a sense. Um, I met them in person, and they were just wonderful and also um margaret my editor was running interference as well and i think that was pretty helpful you always hear horror stories about the estates of, of different authors and how they will meddle and that was just not my experience at all they could not have been lovelier people i just felt so fortunate to be working with them 
That's great. Yeah, that is what you hope for. I, I often will work with dead authors. It's a lot simpler. But um, oh, yeah. <laughs> public domain, yes. I should say as well, public domain works. <laughs> yeah, I actually, th this is a bit morbid, but when I got that email from Margaret asking me if I'd be interested in doing this project, the first thing that I did was Google to see if Madeline Lengel was alive, because I was like, I just don't know that I can do this if she's, if she's alive. Like, what a, what a terrifying prospect to be messing around with this important book and have the author looking at it and, and judging you. And um, I found out after finishing the book that she really never wanted her, her books to be adapted at all, which made me feel not great. But at the same time, I feel like this is one of the better adaptations of A Wrinkle in Time that is out there. Like there's, there's one, one bad one. And then the most recent one is, is pretty good, the film. Mm -hmm. And then there's mine. So I, 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 seem I, th to I think she would be okay with mine of, yeah. of those three. <laughs> right. And I think, the, I, think the, yeah, I think the first one came out during her lifetime. I think she yes. responded to it or dismissed it. it. <laughs> yes, she was very dismissive. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that was actually one of the things that turned her against adaptations. So that's sure. a scary thought. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, I believe in I believe in culture recombining and reinventing itself. And uh, yeah, I mean, clearly you approach this clearly as someone who really cared for the cared for the work. No question. Yeah, and one of the nice things after the book came out was that I just got so many lovely messages from folks who had kids or were aunts and uncles or teachers to um, children who struggle with reading or just are not interested. And um, I heard from a lot of folks that this would be the first book that a kid ever read on their own. And th that to me is just such a compliment to the medium of comics. And also, I think it's so cool that just having pictures there to sort of guide you through could make this this really heady work accessible to kids. And the text, almost all of the text is in the graphic novel. So if they can read this, they could read the novel. And that's like, that's such a cool feeling. Yeah, that's very exciting. I think that's exactly what you want. I'm always, I'm always looking for the next generation of readers. So that's, that's wonderful that you got to hear from them. I, this um, is just a, a section I or a page I like. Mm -hmm. This is from I can't remember the name of this planet. Um, sorry, it's been a while. Sure. <laughs> With the 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 squiggly. The anti. Beast. Ant beast. Thank you so much. Um, there's a section where Ant Beast is is singing to Meg while she's in bed recovering from her paralysis and, and whatnot. And I wasn't really sure how to depict that in the book. So I, I went with this and I am still happy with this page. Yeah, well, between this and the, the page with the black panels, like you really take advantage. And you, as you said, you had the space to, um, to, to do some visual visual uh, storytelling uh, techniques. Yeah, well, I, I say that I have the space. I know I'm running long, so this is probably gonna be my last little comment, but I was not supposed to run to 400 pages. I messed <laughs> up my pagination in the script and I did not know. I like basically accidentally reset my page count at some point. So I sent the script in thinking it was like 250 or something like that. And when I realized my mistake, I called my agent. My agent was furious. She was like, there's no way they're going to publish a 400 page graphic novel. I was like, oh God, what do I do? Mm -hmm. uh, but they, you know, they, they went for it. And <laughs> I dream of having 400 pages ever again. <laughs> that's great. Wow. That's good advice for people. No, it's not. <laughs> Sneak it in under the wire. Don't do that. No, don't do that. Don't do that. I'm kidding. <laughs> I've never done anything nearly that long. Um, I put in these two. I found these uh, in 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 the more recent uh, paperback edition. There were some pages of uh, behind the scenes, which I just liked seeing some of your process. Um, 
and it, I just I just love process, so I had to throw these in. But um, you see, I see you still sort of playing with it even after the pencil stage. You're still kind of moving things around and figuring it out. So it was fun to see. Is that it? Oh, there's one more. Yeah, just just because I couldn't resist. So thanks, Hope. We'll um we'll get back to you um in a few minutes. Ryan, thank you for being so patient. Oh, of course. Uh, this has been amazing, and I've agreed with everything everyone has said. <laughs> awesome. Let me give you your introduction. Ryan North is the New York Times bestselling and Eisner winning writer whose recent work includes the nonfiction books, How to Take Over the World, and How to Invent Everything, uh, as well as the graphic novel adaptation of Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five, the uh, Unbeatable Squirrel Girl series from Marvel. And he's also collaborated with William Shakespeare on Choose Your Own Path versions of his plays. Many more things. Very long bio, Brian. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Happy to be here. Thanks. Thanks. Um, you actually gave me kind of a very specific kind of breakdown for your slides. So I don't know if you have a have a script you're going to read, or we'll just talk no, these we through. Can, as we we can talk our way through it, but this is these are just the covers of the two books. That one on the left, I actually did something very similar to what Hope described, where I bought a paperback copy and I just started writing things in the margins of like this needs to go in and this will definitely not go in and and scenes I wanted to include the stuff that didn't go in was uh really this book is was written in the past and language changes and Kurt Vonnegut was a humanist and I don't believe he'd want to hurt people and so there were just some some words that had aged poorly and some scenes that had aged poorly and I'm like I we can just not put those in and that's part of the adaptation process so um we go to the next slide. I think I have something to talk about. Oh yeah, here's an example where I looked through and I was, this is me breaking it down by panels. Panel one, let's show the prayer. Panel two, let's have a beat panel where no, nothing said. And panel three, let's have this line in a narration box. It, I want to hit as hard in the graphic novel as it hit for me when I was reading it. Um, and I also, I wish I had 400 pages. <laughs> I had 170 pages. I did a very uh, nerdy trick of, I worked out how long the pages were in my paperback copy. And I had a new 175 pages in my graphic novel. So I wrote out an equation so I could plug the number into how much I'd written and gave me how much I had left. So I was always aware of if I was going over or under, which helped me know how much I had to compress certain scenes. If I had room to sort of stretch out, like here's a thing that takes basically half a page and I'm giving it a whole page and really letting it breathe. Cause I felt like the way Slaughterhouse Five is structured, it's a lot of uh, different scenes and different times. And the nice thing with the graphic novel is you very efficiently can show what time you're in by just the clothing and the color and the, the way the scene looks. So I had it was almost a more efficient way of telling the story in that sense, which helped a lot. And also gave me the advantage of I could have a certain a single page be a single time and keep the unit of the page being almost part of a unit of story, which worked out well. Um, let's use the next slide, what I put there. Oh, yeah, so this is something I was really pleased with in the book. Um, Kurt Vonnegut did this trick in this book and other books where instead of writing a story, he'll just describe to you a story. <laughs> he'll give you the, the high level gist of it. And in this book, it's done through a character named Kilgore Trout, who's a described as a failed science fiction author. So here's, here's a summary of his stories that were done as this like really crappy author. And I thought, well, if we're going to do graphic novels, let's have him, it fits the character to be even more down market. Now he's writing comic books. <laughs> he's writing golden age comic books and no one respect him at the time. And it lets us show his comic and bring it to life. So if you hop to the next slide, you can see that we switched art styles completely and made his comics, these little books within a book where you could read these actual Kilgore Trout comics and get the, the taste of the stories. And the nice thing is, uh, when you're working in this sort of style, the comics were so compressed anyway, everyone's just telling you exactly what they think and their thought balloon is telling you exactly what they're thinking, that I could kind of almost copy and paste um, what Vonnegut was describing the story in summary and have it work for these characters in the comic. Um, so that, that was just tons of fun. I, in adapting the book, I always wanted and I'm sure we were all, all the same thing. Uh, I was always looking for ways that I could make this book, this adaptation argue for itself and make it feel like if you had somehow never heard of Slaughterhouse-Five and never heard of Kurt Vonnegut, 
you would pick up this comic and read it and say, that's a good comic, not like that's a good adaptation of a prose novel. I want to feel like it had been born in this medium and was indigenous to the medium. And so anywhere where I could do something that you could only do in comics, that was something I was, I was grabbing for. What's on the next slide? Oh, I, by the uh, way, I love that you've included these. After Hope, <laughs> after Hope said that she wrote all over her book, I thought, oh, I should have had everyone send me their copies <laughs> because I love seeing this stuff. Yeah, so this is me writing over the book. And this is a comics trick I could only use once. Um, this is a character named Derby telling a story about how he was captured during the war. And Vonnegut often would summarize conversations, which works great in prose. Uh, it does not work great in comics. And so in this case, I thought, well, I can't, I love how this, this conversation is summarized. It's beautifully summarized where he's being, uh, shot at by Germans and it ends with saying so the Americans put down their weapons down and they came out of the woods with their hands on top of their heads because they wanted to go on living if they possibly could and I'm like I love this I love Derby so if you hop to the next slide I did this trick and you only do once because it's clearly a trick where Derby starts telling the story and the narration box go on top of his balloon so I can switch into Vonnegut's voice there and go through the the summary and get to have him say and then we put our weapons down and come up with our hands up on top of our heads sir because we want to go on living if we possibly could so it's a little dance between what the narration was and what the characters are saying and this was one case where i thought i can do this comics trip trick of summarizing the balloons without even letting you see them which felt like it captured the spirit of the book of let's just get to the good part let's skip ahead tell you what happened but still make it feel like this is something you can only really do in a comics format what's right. on the next slide Oh, and here's here's where I, I really space things out. Um, for me, the, for the heart of the graphic novel, I thought was the book books built around the bombing of Dresden. And in the comic, I wanted to be able to make that the heart of the book and really make it land that there is a loss here. And so this is the first time we see the city of, of Dresden. And it's actually Kurt Vonnegut saying there it is. But I in my notes, I'm like, you don't need to, to see that because we already described him. But I want, to have, I want him to say, there it is, and then have a splash where he's just saying Oz. So we have this panel of them traveling the train, and then you go to the next slide, and it's this beautiful two-page spread that uh, Albert did for the book. And then this is echoed later on in the book when Dresden's destroyed. We have a similar two-page spread of just the city in ruin. And I believe those are the only two-page spreads in the book, except for one sequence with the Tralfamadorian Tralfam aliens. But it was, again, like you're comics space is time and you want this moment to hit so let's just have this beautiful page and it made me realize realize again and again because I always keep realizing it that when you're in comics you absolutely have the easy job as the writer uh, especially in adaptation because I just could almost I could type up what how Kurt described this scene and say I want this to be really good please <laughs> and it's that the artist who has to draw it and make this this beautiful sequence and had you worked with him before no, we had never met before. And one of the many things that COVID took from us was the chance for me to, to meet Albert and, and hang out in person. Um, so I, I was in the play position I normally like to be in where I had to write the script without knowing who the artist would be. And uh, once we got the artist, um, it was great. We, we clicked really nicely and um, he did all these things where he was bringing his own ideas and, and elevating what I'd written. It was a really great collaboration. That's great. It seemed like, it felt like you'd written it for him. Yeah, yeah. It's, I wish I had, because it, it felt like that to me too. <laughs> What's on the next slide? Oh, here's the opposite problem. We had an adaptation where um, Vonnegut again is summarizing conversation okay. and he's, he writes like, Derby spoke movingly of the American form of government with freedom and justice and opportunities for all. And he doesn't tell you what he's saying <laughs> and i already used up my comics trick of like covering up the balloons i wouldn't it wouldn't work there either i couldn't cover up what's supposed to be a moving speech with someone telling you trust me it's a moving speech so this one when i got to this point i actually kind of laughed because it felt like it was vonnegut beyond the grave playing a prank on me where he's like well now you have to write this thing I, I, you know how what it's supposed to be it's supposed to be beautiful and moving so go for it and the nice thing about it was uh i felt i always felt like when i read kurt vonnegut You'd slip into his voice. It's such a distinctive way of writing that I would call it Vonnegut disease, where I'd start my writing would start to sound like Kurt Vonnegut. And you have to avoid that because you don't want to steal his style. It's very 
classically him. But this was one point in my life where I got to uh, do lean into that and try to make it sound as bonnie good as possible. So you wouldn't notice the sequence where I started writing and making up new things. And uh, to my pleasure, I read one review where the guy was a little bit down on the book. He's like, he just, he didn't add anything. He just took what was there. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I did. I got away with it. You didn't <laughs> notice where I added stuff. That's perfect. What's in the next bit? I think I just talk about the, uh, the speech on the next slide. Oh, this one. Oh, no, I don't. So this is, this is one thing. Um, this was all I'll bear, which I loved. Um, there's in the book, Vonnegut would uh, draw pictures sometimes, little illustrations. And he's not, a, he's not a visual artist, but he would just have fun drawing these pictures. And in this sequence, uh, there's a woman with a serenity prayer that we saw earlier in a bracelet above her, uh, between her breasts. If you go to the next slide, what Albert did is he took that image and traced it. So Vonnegut's art gets copied into the graphic novel when we're, when we're doing that sequence. And I love the idea of having art in this prose book and then making sure in the graphic adaptation that it gets, it gets carried over. I thought that was a uh, sweet and beautiful. I didn't notice that until uh, we were doing a panel and he showed me and I was like, that's, that's my favorite thing in the book. <laughs> I didn't even see it. It's so good. So that's a, that's a quick run through of, of uh, the adaptation of Slaughterhouse Five and the that's fun we great. had with it. That's great. I, I did want to say one thing about it, what that reviewer said, who they said you didn't add anything to it. There's a funny thing in a lot of comics criticism where they only respond to the words. And yeah. Kind of forget there's images. <laughs> so, you well, know. yeah, there, there was one sequence in the beginning of the book where in the prose novel, Vonnegut is describing everything this character has. And he has a huge paragraph of just, yeah, this, 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 and your eyes glaze over and gives the effect of there is a bunch of stuff. I don't really care how much of it. There's just a lot of it. And so in the graphic novel, we showed him as like a paper doll with all the items around him in space, the same sense of there's a lot of stuff around him, but I'm not going to look at each individual item and be like, oh, yes, that's the foxhole Bible and that's a pillow, blah, blah, blah. And so like for me, that felt this is the, the joy of adaptation is we're taking this effect of that's a lot of stuff and putting it in a new medium in a different way. And you're clearly adding something at that point. <laughs> if I wasn't adding, I would just be taking the words and put them on the page. There's, there's a transformative aspect of adaptation that I think is the joy of it. I feel like the thing a good adaptation does is it argues for its own existence and says there's something here that is different than what's in the original, but they're still connected and they're, they're still the same idea, just told in a different way. I, I think that's really fascinating. I, that's, I think that's a great way to put it. And also, um, and maybe a great way to stop this part of the conversation. Um, but I want to, we are actually running late because I was really engaged with what all of you were saying. <laughs> so if you all wouldn't mind hanging out a little bit, I think I will put aside my questions because I think I've talked enough and we will go to the questions from the audience. So if you can hang out for a little bit longer, that would be great. And we'll see what people have to say. And I will stop sharing my screen because we can, yeah, put that aside. So uh, thanks everybody, that was really great. Um, my head's full, but I wanna, <laughs> I wanna hear more from everyone. Um, Please, for those of you who are watching, uh, you can put your questions in the chat. Um, I did want to say one more thing, actually, in response to the, the adding things. I think all of your books, all, all four of your books, all of the books that the four of you have done, I think sort of increase the literacy of, of people reading comics. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes when there are critics, who don't quite get it. I think people are more astute comics readers these days because there's so many great things uh, happening right now. Uh, so I see from the chat that John unfortunately had to leave. He sends his apologies. Um, let's give a silent applause for John. Mm -hmm. But we, the, I, if the three of you can stick around, that would be great. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. take some questions. Um, I can certainly think of things if there's any... Uh, I think there's two questions so far. Ah, in the Q and A box. Oh, yeah. thank you. <clears throat> oh, here we go. Uh, let me let me go. Uh, what are some of the biggest changes you've experienced between the creation process and publishing now versus publishing ten years ago? I guess this is for 
some of us in the group. <laughs> any, any, I, I mean, will let you all talk. You, <laughs> that sounds three, like a health question to me. You may have, you may have had fun challenges in the last five years, but does anybody have any thoughts about that? Uh, it, it, it seems to me there's more opportunities now. There's more places to, to have your work uh, seen uh, online, whether you're using Tapas or other forms like that that are web comics, or uh, you know, more and more publishers seem to want to do this now. But anyone else? I think there's. I think. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Hope. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> I think there are more opportunities, but there are also just so many more incredibly talented cartoonists working now that it feels harder to make a splash. Mm -hmm. I gotta say, I kind of agree, but then again, I haven't been around that long. Uh, I don't think that I probably would have been able to break in at all into this industry if if it wasn't for tapas, because I just didn't know where to go and I didn't have the formal educate, education and like the, um, the connections that people might have. Um, so, and, and also I didn't really expect the story that got everyone's attention to get everyone's attention the way it did on Tapas. Um, so speaking from my experience, it was a lot easier once I knew like how to exist in this state um, because it just, it came more naturally to me than like thinking how would I have done it 10 years ago because I have no idea, <laughs> like absolutely none. I like, I feel like there's more of an, an appetite or there's more an understanding that you can do neat things in the medium. Um, yeah. I, that, that slide you had at the beginning, uh, Bob, of, of the Hamlet page where it's just him with a giant text balloon they put in a soliloquy. <laughs> I was amazed by that because it, it feels like either this is like a really bold choice or just like full admission of defeat <laughs> you're like i don't know there but it is if, if what I do you want from me that on tapas i would get beat up by my readers yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they would just surround me beat the crap out of me i've what never seen doing? a balloon that big There's... but like that that felt like this is where the standard for sort of adaptation was these classic illustrated books where you just sort of say i don't know there it is we drew a picture around the page what else do you want yeah, and, and that's, that's not the only one from that era that looks no. like that. There were other pages like, like that. Um, yeah. I mean, I my heart goes out to them. It's like working artists, you got to crank it out. Sometimes. Yeah, no, it's, it's it's a hard problem. I mean, I, it, I feel like the advantage we have to doing graphic novels is you have at least a bit more time. You're not doing a monthly book. Like, okay, you've got 21 days, do Hamlet, and next week it's Macbeth. Like, there's no time yeah. to think there. You're just running. Right, right. The, the current like the currency of everything like you know coming in like as it like into what it is now it's like I can find some things that we could better in the whole like in the whole field but definitely things are a little a lot more flexible than like they must have been back then but also like with uh with the internet uh just the the like you were mentioning the ways that you can like story tell it's not restricted to com web comics or web novels or even like vertical stroll or anything like that. I mean, you were uh, with Homestuck. That was the first time I ever saw something like that, and I was like, uh, "What? Like you can, you can do, do this? That? Yeah. yeah!" And it like it kicked off a bunch of people like my age that were like, "Wow, I can be creative and I don't have to focus on like a like how how do I make comic pages? Because it's not just about panels. It's about how do you put those panels on a page and stuff like that." And Ryan, like seeing the examples from your book, I was just like, oh, so smart. Oh my God. Like how do you, <laughs> like you think outside the box. And like you said, you, you brought something to this adaption, uh, which is very important. And like, I kind of wish that other, uh, other sources of media would kind of be aware of that. Like, for example, taking a, a web comic, turning it into a TV show or something like that, like bring something new to the fact that like, why did you make it a TV show instead of just encouraging people to read comics? Uh, I went off the off the rails <laughs> right there with you i think it's great no not at all that's absolutely right uh i'm gonna keep reading the q a uh yeah. there's a question for hope you mentioned avoiding caption boxes earlier in your career because they took you out of the story what convinced you that they were a useful tool rather than something that broke up the reader's experience um they're very efficient and like i mentioned i don't usually have 400 pages to work with <laughs> to just sort of like organically get around to things happening. Um, 
and so yeah there you can you can just get in you can get out the you can convey a lot of information very quickly um and i appreciate that you know they have their place everything has its place all the tools yeah. are good and I, I love like seeing ryan's examples from from his book i i think i'm just at this place in my life as an artist that i don't want to throw anything away if it is useful in any yeah. context why limit yourself I, I had the exact same path as hope where i would not really use narration boxes in my comics and then uh i did a book that had a very tight page limit and i was like i don't think i can just cover this all in text and, and thought balloons and dialogue and thought balloons and then you you tried and you're like man this is so efficient <laughs> to have someone just have a box that says my name is so and so and this is my deal and you just saved yourself five pages by just turning the audience saying here's what you need to know <laughs> yeah yeah totally it's... did did uh writing monthly books sort of push you down that road a little bit too because i know that happened for me mm -hmm. it was actually it was yeah. i did i did it uh not a lot in squirrel girl because it, did, it didn't feel like i needed it but then i wrote this uh this dc constantly middle grade book and i just i the only way I could make it happen was doing that, getting it in. So it was actually the more room of the graphic novel. I think I wrote too much story and had to really, I wasn't used to the form. I had to really compress it down with these narration boxes to get it all to fit. I, I'm just, I'm just like so impressed like that. Okay, let me start over. When, <laughs> when I first started doing comics, like as just like, a, I wanted to tell a story and I don't have the, the funding, the time, the energy to do animation, which is mm. what I truly wanted to do at first. But now I'm like completely, I'm, I'm committed to comics. Team comics. Yeah, team comics, I love it. Um, I was so afraid to like use some of the tools that you guys are mentioning and like, like seeing examples of like how both of you, uh, you know, just like brought something new to uh, the story. Um, it's, it makes me like have confidence. <laughs> like, I'm just like, oh, well, like you, yeah. Like it's the whole like learning the box before you can break it. I'm like, maybe I'm finally in a place where I'm confident enough to break the, the mold. Um, because like, it's just like, you know, in the communities online, they'll be like, I don't know, like that's not how you do things. And I'm just like, why are there rules? I thought the whole thing was <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, sometimes you just have to be like, well, it worked. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. New question. Yes. Uh, next question. This has been wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so thank you. Uh, when when a writer delivers a script to the artist, what does the script look like? Like a screenplay? Uh, actually, John, uh, who unfortunately is not here, but uh, on in John's book, you actually see a little bit of an example of how a page is a script is laid out for him, and it tends to be broken down panel by panel. But lots of people do it very differently. Any thoughts about that? For, well, there isn't my actually script, a... sorry, go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> okay, I was gonna say for my script, for usually I break it down by panel, and it's not quite a screenplay, it's more like panel one, here's what's happening, here's what they're saying, panel two, here's what's happening, here's what they're saying. Um, the main thing I always remember when writing a comic script, because I'm never writing for myself to illustrate it, is I'm always writing for someone else, and this is not something that the audience will see. It's not even it's not even written for the editor. It's written for the artist. I want the artist to read this and feel like I can't wait to draw this. Like I, it's kind of a love letter to them. This is why I find it so hard to write a script for someone who I don't know. Like I don't know who's drawing this. How do I how do I connect with them? That's true. I guess I, um, I completely appreciate the differences and like how the like I've only worked with two writers so far and then myself and all three styles are totally different. Mine is literally just like I tap in and I'm just like. Brr. And then I look back and I'm just like, okay, <laughs> like, but like- <laughs> Now I have to draw that. Yeah, but then for like Meg Joe, like uh, Ray was literally like a blessing. They were just like panel one, panel two, panel three. Um, I, was, I was free to go in and like say, suggest like combinations or splitting up, but they also like straight up just included links to references in the script. And I was just like- Great. Ah! <laughs> that's great. <laughs> but it's totally different. Sorry, Hope, go ahead and cut you off. Oh, that's, no, it's okay. Uh, well, like you said, you actually, you kind of answered, you said what I was going to say, there's no industry standard for comic scripts. Um, I, like Ryan, do um, panel by panel, page by page, panel by panel. I try and keep all of my script for each page on one page. One page of comic is one page of script, is what I try to do 
just so nothing gets um, lost, but that's yeah. just me. Um, I started getting a little bit more specific with like what's in each panel when I started working with artists who aren't me, but then I kept it up. So now my scripts look pretty much the same if I'm writing for me or for somebody else to draw. It's work that you're doing before the, like before other work and it's just setting yourself up for like success in the future. Like once I saw a professional script, I was just like, I could be helping myself out. I really could be doing nice things for myself as opposed to just hitting enter every once in a while. Yeah, totally. Because like when, you, when you're writing it, you're thinking about how it's going to look on the page. And even if a lot of time passes between when you're writing the script and when you're drawing the script, you remember when you sit down with yes. it, you remember what you were thinking. It, it I'm, is sure. Weird that I'm sure. I'm assuming it's the same for no, you. It is for me. <laughs> some people will actually and i do this too some people will actually break down a page like they'll just make boxes and then just sort of put the put the balloons in and mm -hmm. i've never passed one of those on to an artist but i imagine that there are some writers that actually kind of do like breakdowns and then give those to the artists to rework and figure out yeah i, I think ever... uh like it's similar to like when when i have like a private person come and ask for a commission uh even if they're not going to be a professional artist it really does help when they're like here's a thumbnail of some stick figures this is kind of what i'm having in mind i'm like awesome at least i have an idea of where you're starting so if there's ever a moment where like the writer is just like i think i can show this to you visually better um this is something that i really want to look specific certain way but you know free to be feel free to, to add your ideas too but then it's always helpful to just like add any references resources if I'm not going to use it I won't use it but <laughs> over communicating is better yeah agree with that agreed and it's a small group you're working with maybe an artist or a couple of artists so it's a small group of people that you're communicating with so you can be more intimate I guess in the way you write these things well, let's see. Do you have a dream project, work, or author, and why would you like to adapt them? Maybe you already did it. Yeah, I, I wanted to echo what Hope said, where when they asked me to do Kurt Vonnegut, I felt like I don't want to be the person who screws up Vonnegut. Like, I love this author. I don't want to be the guy who, who ruins it. And so I came really close to saying no, because I was like, let someone else screw this up. Like, I don't <laughs> to be that guy um and for for me i think what what made this kind of the dream come true project for me is that it was a book that i had read at a very not a very young age it's not suitable for young readers but i read it in, <laughs> in like end of high school and i read it for fun it was never homework and i really it was an introduction to the author and it was sort of one of those formative books for you it's like just like so many books are for so many people. And it was interesting because I had previously done these choose your own path books with adapting Shakespeare. And there I was like, you know, Shakespeare's the most canonized writer in the English language, but whatever, I'm going to have fun with it. No fear at all. Like I'm not going to ruin Shakespeare and I'm not afraid of any Shakespeare fans. But with this, I was, there was, uh -huh. there was fear of like, I respect Vonnegut more than I respect Bill Shakespeare. Uh -huh. And so I don't want to, to mess it up. So there was that, that fear that I think it's part of what made it a dream project was that I was so afraid of doing it poorly. Yeah. If that makes sense. It does make a lot of sense. I don't I don't know if I have any dream ones right now because I'm just kind of feeling where I where I want to go. Like I'm I'm following the wind, but at the same time, like if I see something I like, I I go that way. Mm -hmm. Like I I've I've learned a lot from working with uh, the writers that I've worked with to the point where I'm feeling more confident in my own stuff. So my dream is really to just have the confidence to go into writing my own original things um, and just get it done as opposed to like second guessing myself and like, will people like it? It doesn't matter. Like your niche is out there, even if you don't know exactly like where they are, <laughs> like if that makes sense. <laughs> um, definitely. So, so definitely like, I don't have any dream adaptations. I don't have any dream like creators I want to work with because like I, I just I appreciate like that every artist is just perceiving the world in their own world and their art represents that and so really I will look at any artist and be like I want to make that I want to make that I want to make that <laughs> <laughs> it's like you can't make everything free <laughs> so uh I think for me I was like 
what did I read recently that I really loved that I think would make a good a good graphic novel? And they're both castle books, which is kind of funny. Um, I Capture the Castle would be one. No one would give me money to do that because it's a period piece. <laughs> um, but it's such a wonderful book. And um, also, is it called We've Always Lived in the Castle? Somebody yes. help me. Is yep. that the right title? Okay, I think so. there we go. Very different. We have always lived in the castle, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Anywho, two very different uh, YA-ish castle books. <laughs> Somebody call me, publishers. Let's go. Pick it up. Come on, guys. Somebody's out there. Someone's out there. Um, all right. Well, this is this is uh, I. Well, this is. I was wondering if we should bring this up, and and someone did bring it up. Any thoughts about telling stories of the Ukraine travesty? Um, that I didn't, I mean, it's on everyone's mind now. And I was actually thinking about like how literature gives us perspective on these things, which is maybe the nicest thing I can say right now about it because I don't, I think it's too close. I don't know. Does it's, anyone it's have thoughts about unfolding it? Yeah. Right it's literally unfolding right now. It's like, I, I, you so, can't, I mean, no. there are, there are there are uh, there are those political cartoonists who are responding to current events, but I don't know if anyone here is in that position where they feel like they can be there in the moment. I I, I need years to to um, process things. So yeah, Same. I don't even want to write anything about the pandemic. No, I have right. negative a thousand interest in that. Like a, with, I, with I, the I was, Ukraine -ish. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ryan. I was just I was just with the pandemic. I was thinking like. Barely on the pandemic, I'm realizing like, I don't want to see any stories about people in the pandemic. I don't see any like romantic com comedies where they quarantine together and they're oh, different yeah. people, but sparks fly. And I was like, I really had a visceral like, I don't want this. And I was like, well, what is it? Because it. like World War II ends, and there's so many World War II stories after that that people seem to be into. And but that was also a very traumatic thing for so many people. So I haven't figured it out, but I know that I do not want to do anything related to pandemics. And I don't know why. <laughs> That's why it's like, oh, I'm the same. I don't understand it. <laughs> I think it's just, it's such a, it's such, like both. Like, I know we kind of brought in the pandemic talk, but I'm just going to go back to Ukraine. It's like, it's not my story to tell. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm viewing it. And of course, like, if there's a possibility of things escalating, uh, it'll definitely affect everyone on earth and everyone should care. Um, just like any, um, you know, conflict overseas, any conflict with human beings. Um, but it's not my story to tell. I think that if a uh, Ukrainian or a Russian uh, civilian or anyone both want to come to me and like have me illustrate their story, like I would definitely never close the door on that. But writing it, not my place. It's, it's funny, at the beginning of the Slaughterhouse sort of press cycle, I did a interview with Stars and Stripes magazine with this guy who was calling me from Afghanistan. And I had to get up really early to take his call. And he asked me what the theme, like what, what's the major message of Slaughterhouse Five? And I felt like such a jerk sitting in my comfortable office and be like, you know, war is bad <laughs> to this <Yeah>. guy <laughs> in Afghanistan. Like it, because it, it's it's not my story to tell. But Kurt was there, and Kurt lived this world story, and I'm adapting his words. So it's I'm I'm coming by it honestly. I'm trying to do justice to it. But yeah. it was this this whole moment of like, can I just somehow like cancel this whole conversation because I feel like such a fraud all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. But yeah. but it's like in the end, it is a human story. Um, and like someone said in the, in the comments, like uh, you can tell a story as it's coming out, but um, it just depends on what kind of story it is. Is it about a person who's going to be a character who is in it and like during the like, like they're experiencing it or is it actually about the politics? Uh, if you're doing it in the moment, you're going to probably get like, you're going to run into like propaganda. You're going to run into like people who are very like sensitive on the facts and the experiences right now. It's like, I think it's fair to let, to let things come to not like, obviously like come to the best outcome it possibly can. And then like to listen to the people affected. Um, and then that's like when I would feel comfortable being a part of any project regarding it. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely, that was great. Yeah, sure. I mean, you, there's work out. If you're if you were looking for those responses, they are out there. You can find mm -hmm. them. Um, I I just speaking for myself, and I guess the panel feels the same way. It's like we're, we're not there yet, but the, the work is there. 
work is out there. Um, let's see. Um, can, oh, this is a big one. <laughs> can you further describe the exact selection development process of designing pages, layout and pacing, adapting written text into a visual narrative? How long I to lost, make a sequence? My brain <laughs> stopped have? making sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that, 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 perhaps there's another, I don't know if any of you, maybe a, a quicker version of that is, did any of you refer to text to help you learn to make comics that maybe we could send this person to who is, is interested in this? Uh, I actually I saw, am, yeah. go ahead. sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I saw a panel last night, another Will Eisner panel about him as an instructor. And he and many other people have done a lot of really good books about uh, making comics. So for instance, uh, Will Eisner's Comics and Sequential Art book is like a text for a lot of people uh, that, that people uh, learn, you know, people grew up with and, and learned from as they were starting to make comics. But it goes into a lot of these questions. Um, I, I had a book called How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way, which is not a way I would draw comics, but you know, there's <laughs> lots of books out there that, um, that show you different ways of approaching this. It's such a big subject we probably don't yeah. have the hour we need to start it <laughs> i literally I'm, I'm someone that just learns as i like if i read a book or like i'll read a comic and i'm just like oh i like the way that they did this like and then i try to deconstruct and understand why they made those decisions yeah. as opposed to reading a how-to book uh i haven't have a chance to actually ever pick up a how-to book even though i've been wanting to but i think maybe i'm a little like nervous too because like one thing that i did not enjoy that I got from college was uh, I was I was actually more free with my expression before college and then I like restricted myself and now I'm learning to like to loosen the reins again um, and just have fun and experiment because that like everything doesn't have to be polished and commercial um, so like if you want to know like oh like how do I use a speech bubble versus a caption versus this and that uh, that's very important because that's just like learning your like your terminology. Uh, but you know, like, just like have fun with it. Yeah. That, that was my comics education too, which is reading other books. And yeah. it's, um, it's funny with the adaptation thing. Someone asked me like, what adaptations, graphic novel adaptations did you read before doing Slaughterhouse? And I was like, I avoided them all because I was yeah, worried. Yeah. I wanted to do something that I thought was like, I wanted to do original stuff. And if I saw yeah. someone else had done my great idea, I'd be like, well, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> I just yeah. tried to avoid it wherever I could and just relied on general knowledge of comics. Mm -hmm. Oh, you? I don't know that I have anything to add. <laughs> Every, <laughs> I, I co sign. <laughs> okay. Uh, Kate, I'm assuming we're okay for time. I don't know if you folks are still willing to go on. We have a few more questions, but I don't want to keep anyone from childcare or anything else that might be requiring. Uh, my mom is asleep, so yeah, no. okay. <laughs> I, I have lost all anxiety. I'm good now. I'm great, my great. All right, we'll, we'll we'll keep going until they kick us off, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or everyone leaves. Uh, here's another one. Um, any advice to a starting illustrator to get comics out into the world where they can be seen? Well, there's lots of lots of places. Now is the best Three. time. Oh yeah, yeah. it's like now is the best time. Like like I said, I started off. Uh, with web comics and I didn't expect any, I was Smack Jeeves, I think. Uh, I posted yeah. my comic Jamie on there for free, didn't expect anyone to read it. Uh, you, you can never guess what's gonna pick up and what's not. You just gotta do what you want to do. Uh, if you're not restricted by a contract, post it everywhere. Just be mindful of like the terms of the websites. Uh, post it Instagram. Mirroring is the best thing you can do because there are gonna be different audiences on every platform. So you might get some overlay, but it's not always the case. Um, and uh, just interact interact with your audience because that's one thing that we got today that people didn't have as freely in the past. Um, that comes with its own. That's a double edged sword because you can, you know, people can be mean, but uh, you know, like you got to take the fact that someone's reading it, leaving a comment. That is the best feeling in the world when like someone really enjoys what you're doing. Um, but yeah, like all I'd say is just tap as webtoon, start there. Uh, Instagram, if you want, Tumblr's still a thing. And if you yeah. want to monetize it, then there's coffee, there's Patreon. Like this is the time to experiment and do things with your creations and, um, and not feel restricted at all. 
I'm so glad you were able to answer that because I still get this question. I'm like, I'm too old. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's been too long. <laughs> you already got into the system, you know, like you got it. You don't have to worry about like uh, what's it called, the grind anymore. <laughs> oh no, I'm still grinding. Believe You're me. Still don't grinding. Worry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's the business. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, just different gears. Basically. Still a grind. Um, but that's great. I mean, I, I would only encourage everybody. There's places to get your work out there. Yeah, the only time. thing, like the only crappy part about it nowadays, like, and I don't know what it was like in the past, but I'm only speaking from my own experience is having to be the writer, the, uh, the um, writer, the illustrator, the public uh, like relations, da, 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 da. when I finally got an agent, I was like, I don't know. And then I like, you know, gave 50% of my work away. And I was like, oh my God, is this what freedom is like? <laughs> Like, I don't have to wear like 30 hats anymore. <laughs> That's great. Uh, all right. Uh, what, how much did you consider the idea of what will the fans of the original book think? Or is that a recipe for disaster? I tried not to think about it at all. And I, I hid from all of the criticism because, I mean, I don't know what there was to gain. I would have, I was, it was scary. I would have frozen up. Like I already tried to turn it down, you know? So mm -hmm. um, people are, I am cool with whatever opinion people care to have of my work, but I don't know that it really benefits me, especially with a project like this, which I don't even own. Like it's mm -hmm. not, it's not like, there are a lot of decisions in the book that weren't even really mine. So yeah. um, I'm not, a big uh, review reader person still, even for my own stuff, but yeah. I think that's super healthy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you obviously know my interactions with readers uh, with web comics, but with, when it came to Meg Joe Beth and Amy, yeah, I don't think I considered, because again, like I didn't grow up with the original. So I had to, you know, learn what this meant to people. Uh, and when I went into it, I was done. I finished it. I was like, let's go read the reviews. And I was like, oh my God, people hate me. <laughs> but I think that, especially like, I, I can't remember the organization that did it, but there was an organization like a church that tried to get it canceled because Joe is gay. And I was like, I made oh, it. No. <laughs> they hate me. <laughs> I was like, this book exists for a different generation. It exists to make people excited about graphic novels, about the original, maybe even go read the original. It's not a disrespect to the original, it is a compliment. And if people don't want to acknowledge it, they don't have to. So that's where my mindset is now. Before I was with you, Hope, I was just like, I'm skilled. <laughs> <laughs> For me, the, the closest I came to considering it is just, I wanted the book to, to stand on its own. So it's not that I'm worried, like someone who read Slaughterhouse Prose would hate Slaughterhouse Graphic Novel, it was, I didn't want someone who had read the prose novel to read this and then be like, why, what, what, why are we here? Why does this exist? So that really just boils down to, I wanted to make a, a good book. I wanted to make a really yeah. good book that people would enjoy. And there's stuff you can sort of sprinkle on top of that of, you know, it, I would like to have a version of the story that can reach a new audience. And it's great for people who are, are put off by prose or challenged by prose, all these benefits to to adaptation as a whole, to, to reaching people where they are and in these different mediums. But I think the quarter is just like, I want to make a cool book. And yeah, and you did. That's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what we're shooting for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that has to be the top priority, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. um, oh, here's just a compliment, but I will read it to you. Terrifically interesting about the process of writing that goes with the visual arts. Thanks. Well, you're Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Let's see, here's a question. I think this could be for everyone. When condensing a work for adaptation, how do you decide what must be kept and what can be cut? That's um, for y'all. Yeah. Um, he says, other than the dated stuff that Ryan mentioned. Um, well, I mean, I guess it really depends on what your idea is, what your concept for the story is. You know, when I, when I adapt uh, work, I usually am like pairing it with like, some famous comics character or I'm working in a particular style. So I try to play it to those, to, to the strengths of that uh, character or that style that I'm kind of parodying. 
So it's, it's kind of like finding where the two things that I'm working with kind of meet. But I think every artist kind of, you know, plays to their strengths or, or wants to play against their strengths. So um, I don't know if anyone has specifically specific thoughts about that. Uh, it may yeah, be a matter I, of, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I did the same thing Hope did where there's uh, some elements of uh, religion in Slaughterhouse-Five that I didn't play up in the adaptation because they didn't connect with me. And I was like, all right, I'm, if they hired me to adapt the book, I want to be my adaptation of it. Um, there was saying it's not so much it didn't age well, but um, Vonnegut's description of the main character's wife throughout the book is really mean. <laughs> it's yeah. very unkind towards her, and it even veers into like being unkind to women in general. And I don't think, maybe this is me being charitable, but I, I don't think that's, I want to say what he intended. I mean, he did write it, but I felt like <laughs> I couldn't put the book out and have this like really almost misogynist version of the character. So I, I just, in the pitch to the estate, which they approved, I presume because they didn't stop me. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> here's what I'm going to change, dated language. I'm going to change the way that the wife is portrayed so that she's not a horrible person who ruins his life just by being a woman. And uh, we're going to have an issue with nudity because in the book they're naked, which in prose, it's one line and you can just move on with it. But in a visual medium, you there's a way that could be titillating. I didn't want that to be there. So we're going to have them naked, but they'll always be. We had comics tricks like one, it describes, it says uh, Billy Pilgrim has a tremendous wang. And so we had the the dialogue or the narration box for Tremendous Wang positioned over his crotch where it would be hiding presumably what's there. And then little tricks to cover so that you could, we wouldn't show any naughty bits, um, but we'd still get the idea across. And so that was, it's, it's basically you're, you're trying to figure out what, what plays to your strengths and what plays to the strengths of the medium and play those up, play down stuff that doesn't connect with you or that doesn't fit the medium. I think that's that's all you can do, but hope that I miss yeah. something. Um... I guess I would add that when I'm writing for other artists, I usually try and write to their strengths and interests because, I mean, that's what I would want someone to do for me. And I think you can sort of do that to an extent with an, ad an adaptation as well, just sort of like hit the stuff that you are the most enthusiastic about because then you're more likely to do a good job <laughs> <laughs> if it's not just all cars or, or horses or whatever. Well, it resonates with you for a reason. So like, it's interesting to like, to see that like, this is not supposed to just be like, let's redo what was already done. It's like, this is, this is a brain baby. Like it is like, there's something brand new kind of come out of it. So yeah. like, and there, there, people are hiring you because they want your voice. Like my, I felt like my job was not just compress it by 50% in terms of page count or, you know, to figure out what pictures would go with these scenes. And my job is to what I imagined, and it was a little story I told myself, is that I was an editor and I had hired Kurt Vonnegut to write a comic book and he was a jerk and turned in this 400 page prose novel. And I was like, I, this is due and I need to now fix this. That's cool. <laughs> so it was, it was uh, me sort of adapting his work, but from the point of view of it was always supposed to be a comic and he just didn't read the brief. <laughs> And now I need to fix it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah like to, to go on that thought, it's like it took a while for me to accept that I wasn't like just an artist to like the writer and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like someone had a conversation and I was brought up because of a certain reason. And like, so to have a little more confidence in what I was going to bring to the project as opposed to just feeling like, uh, what's the word? Um, replaceable or like something that could be Bunchable, easily like, yeah, yeah like th there's obviously something I can bring to it. Um, I mean, obviously, I don't think that is caught, like, I don't know how if other people feel that way, but, like, that's just how, my relationship with work culture in the first place, so I had to unlearn yeah. that. I think that's great. Sure. Um, oh, this, is, this is a good question. How does one find a sensitivity editor? Um, I would assume that would be through your publisher. For, I don't know if anyone has worked with that, but worked with a sensitivity editor, if that's come up. I have just I, recently. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I hired somebody once, like freelance, um, but actually a couple of times. But yeah, I only know the freelance a book. I think mm -hmm. with a book, usually your publisher, usually they'll just do it. They'll just run it by somebody and not even tell you these days. Like it's just going to happen, but that's not 
really answering the question. I would love to know this as well. I, I kind of like, like my world, unfortunately, is on Twitter. And uh, so literally, <laughs> I've had situations where I'm like, what do I need? Type it into Twitter. Someone is typically advertising themselves. They'll be like, looking for work, sensitivity reader. Like they, they exist. Sometimes it's just a Google away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. I did the exact same thing. I, I needed a sensitivity reader for a monthly book. And I just, I looked, I couldn't find anything. I asked some friends and they were like, we use this service, which is now defunct. <laughs> so oh. I asked on Twitter and got a lot of recommendations and then left it up so that others could, could see here's some great people. If you're looking for a blind sensitivity reader, here's a lot of people who can do that. So there's there's not as I as far as I could tell, past couple of months there wasn't like a central resource for um, the type of sensitivity reader I was looking for. But mm -hmm. there's people on Twitter. Even if, you don't, even if you don't have an audience on Twitter, there's people who have that audience who have asked this question and, and left the answers up, and you can search mm -hmm. there. So it's not it's not perfect, but it's definitely way better than it used to be. Yeah, that's great. Twitter knows. Let's see. Uh, how did you come to adaptations versus original storytelling? What informed or informs your choices on wanting to do an adaptation rather than construct your own story to write and illustrate? This is probably different for everybody. Um, I would say for myself, I am more interested in hearing what other people have to say than what I think. <laughs> That's part of what's interesting to me. I'm not interested in self-expression exactly. Even though I think you can, I think you can express yourself through other works that you adapt. So, anyway, that's um, what I'm well, I've I've only done the one adaptation because it like broke me. Um, <laughs> <Dang>. <laughs> it was such a huge project. It was such a huge project. I didn't. Yeah. Even, I, I just like burned out. Um, and so, I've wanted to focus on my my own original books because. I felt like if I was going to burn myself out again, I'd rather do it in the service of my own original ideas. Um, but I would probably, I would, I would do another one these days. I've got a better handle on work-life balance and stuff now than I used to. I'm happy to hear that for you. <laughs> yeah, it's a big, it's a big like hill to get over. Yeah. Um, for me, the nice thing, well, normally I will say when I'm writing comics, I can normally write about seven pages a day. That's what I count as a good day if I get seven pages done. And when I was adapting Slaughterhouse Five, I found a good day for me was 10 pages because the what happened next was covered. Like that part of the story was written and the dialogue was written. And I still have to change a lot, but it was a slightly more efficient way of doing it. And for me, this unexpected thing happened at the end where I was holding this book in my hand. And normally when someone praises a book I've worked on, I'm Canadian, I'm like, oh, you know, thanks, but it's not that great. Like it's, I, you deflect the praise because that makes you feel comfortable. I know, I know, it's a Canadian <laughs> thing or it's a me thing, I can't say. But with Slaughterhouse Five, people say, this was a great book. And I'd be like, isn't it, isn't it so cool? <laughs> Cause I didn't write it. So I felt like Vonnegut wrote it and Albert did this amazing job drawing it. And I had like one tiny finger on the wheel where this car was going. And it gave me this weird experience of reading a book that has my name on the cover among others. And being like, that was a really good book. I wish I could write like that. <laughs> and being like, wait, no, I didn't. Yeah. At least I can adapt like that. So I'm not sure if it's something I'd want to chase because I'm not sure how healthy that is to keep adaptive work to make yourself feel like a more accomplished <laughs> writer. But it was it was a neat experience to do once. I gotta agree. Like I think that for me, it felt like I didn't write Meg Jo obviously, but being involved in it in general, and then uh, comparing it with how I felt when I was writing my own stuff, it kind of felt like a step up, not like better, but just like a step between writing your own stuff and writing fanfic. Yeah. <laughs> like creating fanfic, so like you're involved, you're a fan as well, but you're bringing a little piece of yourself to it. Um, uh, I don't know if I'll like. I'm not going to, like you said, like, I'm not going to like chase more adaptions, uh, but the experience, uh, it felt good to have a, a, a book done. It feels good to see like the process. Uh, it just felt like practice, like for the future, like in, I don't think that has the weight that I mean it to have, but 
Um, like I said, like I, I developed so much confidence in my right, my own writing. I didn't write it like in my own writing and like in what I would have done differently now looking back and even just like how I want to streamline my own workflow moving forward. Like it was just, it was just awesome. <laughs> but yeah, again, I'll probably prioritize originals. <laughs> I think we have two questions left. So um, let's see. Uh, hey, Bree, do you think being a Black creator has changed how you publish and produce content? And uh, does it or has it changed your experiences within the comics industry? So yes, um, when I first started illustrating as a kid in like high school, uh, I subconsciously didn't know I could draw Black kids. Like hmm. uh, I, all my characters are white, uh, you know, like, fair, straight. And as I started to learn more about myself, I realized, wow, I don't have to do this. And then the more I learned that people felt like me, I was just like, let me give character, like, let me make characters that we can all relate to. Um, even with Jamie, like, I look back at it now and I did it, I started it like 10, 15 years ago. Um, and it's only now seeing the light of day. But I was like, oh, man, like, could I change his race? Could I change anything about the characters? And I was like, well, you know, it's at this point, I don't want it to be disingenuous. Like Jamie is white for a reason. Uh, and I just built on that, like how would his experience be amongst friends that are like, you know, people of color from different backgrounds, how would he interact with them and how would his privilege play into the story as well? But moving forward, I definitely do want to give, um, I want to take my platform and, you know, help people who come from different backgrounds uh, tell their story or point them in the right direction. And I also wanna diversify my, my cast because um, the one thing I learned from college that helped me think differently outside of like how I've been, uh, for short of a better word, brainwashed into thinking only certain stories could be told is that my teacher told me like, when you're making a character, you need to take a step and ask yourself, why not like another race, another religion, another sexuality, another, perspective or opinion like because that'll help you to write more interesting characters anyway um but you do have to go about things consciously especially when you're going into an area where people have been shut out for so long so yeah i hope that answered the question <laughs> that was a great answer um i think i think this is the last one in the q a which i think we'll call it and this seems like a good place to end are any of you doing panels or appearances at any of the conventions this year? And if so, any cosplay planned? <laughs> Ooh, I have been wanting to get back into cosplay for like five years. I've been too poor. <laughs> <laughs> like I got out of, I like I was using my college money because I was irresponsible to cosplay. And now I'm like, oh no, I have real responsibilities. No. And uh, now I just cannot wait. Don't know if I'm going to be, I think I might be at WonderCon. Um, but still working on that. Um, and if I can, if I can cosplay, I'll tell you what, I'm thinking about what's her name, Gwendolyn from Saga. That would be cool. <laughs> anyway, I'll pass it to someone else now. That's great. Uh, I have a boring answer because it's still really hard to get across the border because of COVID. So I'm not doing, I got no plans to be anything exciting and Unfortunately, no plans to cosplay, so I'm, that's a boring answer for me. But Hope, I'm sure you've got something exciting. I planned. think I'm doing Emerald City this year. Uh, not going to wait that that all works out. We don't have another surge or something, yeah. some scary variant. But yeah, hopefully that. Uh, and that is really it. I miss seeing people so much. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, this is nice. It's nice to see, see everybody, see yeah. folks. Um, I, I, I will I will plug my next event, which is also with the Society of Illustrators, which is they're doing the um, MOCA Festival in April, the Museum of Comic and Cartoon Art Festival. Uh, and that is in Manhattan, very nearby my house, which is why I can go. Um, and uh, very much looking forward to it. Go to the Society of Illustrators website to find out more info. I think it's, I wanna say the April 2nd and 3rd, it's the first weekend. Yes, April 2nd and 3rd. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for sticking around. Um, so sorry, John couldn't uh, stay till the end, but uh, he sends his apologies and, and, and let's give him a, an applause. Thanks again to Bree Indigo, John Jennings, Hope Larson, and Ryan North. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great night.
Hey, everyone. Mm -hmm.